Today we begin this new series called B. And at the beginning of a new year, I don't know, I, as a kid, I remember everybody made a New Year's resolution. Anybody make those anymore? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the problem. By Valentine's Day, they're over, if not sooner. Uh, it was always amazing to me when I oh, was up in Gainesville. I was a member of a gym there. And uh, January was packed. Everybody was at the gym in January. February, not so much. <laughs> it's amazing how resolutions do that. It's amazing, too, how most of the resolutions we make are about what we're going to do or stop doing. We are so focused on being active, and we think, I think sometimes, especially here in our culture, we have turned into human doings rather than human beings. It's all about what you do. In fact, that's how you introduce yourself, right? When you uh, meet somebody, you tell them what you do. Okay, That's not always the way it is in all cultures. And I don't think it's the way that God necessarily intends us to be either. So um, the real issue isn't necessarily what you're always doing. It's who you are in the first place. And out of your being comes your activities and your doing. So uh, David Platt wrote this. He said, what if the main issue in our culture today is not poverty or sex trafficking, homosexuality, or abortion? What if the main issue is God? And what might happen if we made our focus, him, our focus instead? How would we act if we fixed our gaze on the holiness, love, goodness, truth, justice, authority, and mercy of God revealed in the gospel? And I think that's what we're going to be doing in this series at the beginning of the year. And today, we're going to talk about being still. We'll also be talking in the future about be present, be content, be thankful, be at rest, be awake, be loved. God is more interested, really, in your character than in your activities. Um, most students at the university, and I was like this too, you think always about your career. What am I going to do? What am I going to be? And it's really more about your character, not your career. And I don't think that's an overstatement. In fact, the, God himself, the intention he has shown in the scriptures, in Romans chapter 8, he tells us what God wants to happen for us, how we are to become. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God wants you to become like Jesus. God has the intent throughout the scriptures. From the beginning words in Genesis, we see that God made us in his image. What is that image? It is that we image him, that we reflect him to this world, that we look like him, that we are the mirror image to him of his glory. We voice, we give word, we give praise, we give uh, definition, we live out his goodness, his grace, his faithfulness, his truth to this world. That's who we are to be. We voice his beauty. So today we're going to start with be still. It occurs a number of times in scripture, actually, and you, the one that everybody seems to know and have memorized is from uh, Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. But it also occurs elsewhere. Uh, for instance, in Exodus 14, it says, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. And this is when the children of Israel are backed up at the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is coming down on them. They are ready to panic and attack. And God says, I got this. You don't do anything. Just stand there and watch. But the one that we're going to look at today specifically is from a psalm, Psalm 37. It's an acrostic psalm, which means each letter of the Hebrew alphabet starts the next verse. So it's a little long. We're only going to look at eight verses to start with and then a few others throughout. It's Psalm 37, where we read, Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious for wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. 
He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. So the psalm continues to go on to these themes about being still and fretting not. In fact, the words fret not comes up four times in this text. And we're going to be uh, looking at these three points today from this. The source of fretting in our lives, the radical call to be still, and then how can one actually be still? <laughs> That's the hard part for me. It's like, okay, I know I should, but I just not comfortable with it. Why? The Psalms often divide people into two groups. It's very much like Proverbs talks about the fools and the wise, right? But in the Psalms, it's not necessarily the foolish and the wise. It's often called the righteous and the wicked. And this Psalm does it as well. And it sounds like, well, well, I you know, which, which group do you want to be in, right? <laughs> um, here's the thing about that, though. Um, the, this does not mean the good people and the bad people like we usually think. That's not what righteous means in the Psalms. The Bible says we're all sinners and fall short of the glory. There is no one righteous, not even one. That's from one of the Psalms too, Psalm 53. The righteous are not those who are right all the time, that do everything correctly, living kind of, but what they are doing is they're living in the relationship, the covenant relationship that God has established. The fact that God has called you into a right relationship with him, you are now declared righteous. And you respond rightly to that. You are called his very own. It's all grace from the beginning to the end. Your righteousness is the fact that you're related to God. And so you trust him. You try to reflect his goodness. Now the wicked, they're often, like I said, called fools in the Bible as well. They kind of defy God's goodness in the world. They think they can do a better job. In fact, they try to take his place. And by the way, the wicked, often in the Psalms, they're not the ones who don't believe in God. They believe in God, too. They just believe more in themselves and their um, conniving ways and how they can get ahead in this world. Psalm 37 puts it this way. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bows to bring down the poor and needy to slay those whose way is upright. You start finding in this psalm that the wicked are those who exploit other people. They use them. They abuse them. They step on them. They don't care how they get ahead. They're just going to get ahead. And it's all about taking. Now, you could sum up what the wicked are as just simply this in the psalm. They're the takers in life. Psalm 37, 27, uh, 21 says, the wicked borrows but not, does not pay back. You know, they just take stuff. Oh, yeah, I'll get, and they never give it back. But notice the, the contrast. The righteous is generous and gives. So the wicked are takers and the righteous are givers. They understand it's about a giving relationship, God has given me everything. Everything I have is his. There is nothing I can do. I cannot outgive God. I cannot give back, in a sense. Anything I give back is already his in the first place. And then I get to give. And the richness of my life is the richness of my relationships, not the accumulation of stuff. And so the righteous try to reflect God in his goodness and his giving. So Walter Brigham, I was reading a commentary on, on the Psalms from him, and he put it this way. The Psalm nonetheless invites and insists upon a serious adjudication. I know, what a word, right? Basically, the debate is there are two ways in which social power is secured and in which social stability is developed and maintained. And the question is, which one really works? Being a taker or a giver? What kind of a God do you think is behind the creation of all this universe? A giver or a taker? And what way are you going to live 
So where the fretting comes in, and it comes up in this psalm again and again, you could probably kind of guess. John Calvin had said that there's really no certain rule with respect to temporal blessing. That means basically what we find out is that you think it should work out that the givers are the ones who get rewarded again and again in life and everything goes well for them, and the takers are the ones who face, you know, <laughs> what they should face. But it's not the way it works out. Though you'd hope that God would reward those who are giving and punish those who are taking, it's often that the givers get trampled on and exploited, and the takers seem to get ahead. And so, as this psalm talks about in the verse, verse, be not envious of wrongdoers. The fact is, it's so tempting for us to adjudicate between which one are we going to be, how, why are they, and you start to become envious of the people who seem to be winning in this world who are gaining advantage over others. And then once I start envying, you're like, oh, man, I wish. I can't believe. Why, you know, then the next thing that comes is the fretting. And that's why Psalm 37, 7 says, fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. When's the last time you used the word fret? I know, like, James has used it all the time when the fret's on a guitar, but talking about a, the verb fret, have you? Never, hardly, right? And um, it's not a word that we use today. Actually, the word in the Hebrew is a chara. That's a hard chaf. It, it runs backwards. Well, our backwards. It runs right to left. So it's chara. And it means actually to burn or be kindled with anger. It's the slow burn. And when you start seeing the bullies and the people who push and the people who take getting ahead in life, man, that just ticks you off, doesn't it? You're upset and angry. And you know what's amazing to me is I start feeling righteous about that anger. But I think the psalm is very wise because what I find out is I don't have righteous anger. I have self-righteous anger. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It feels like I'm right. No, I should be upset about this. But often it turns into this almost feeling of getting back. Um, traffic is a good example of self-righteous anger. Somebody cuts me off, especially on Corkscrew Road lately. <laughs> that construction just drives me nuts. And somebody cuts me off, and the first thing I want to do is step on the gas, pull around them, and then brake real fast to just try to, right? But what is happening when I'm that way? Have you felt that way on Corkscrew? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. I start to become just like the person I'm saying I hate. I start fighting fire with fire, pushing my way through the world, using people, loving things, feeling so right when I am so wrong. And the psalmist is saying, stop. How does that envy actually work for you? Does it work for you? No. How does fretting, getting angry and upset, does it help you think clearly? Does it advance your character and who you are? No. It doesn't bring about justice either. Throughout the history of the world, you will find that the people who have been oppressed often become the next oppressors. That the people who have been exploited now start to exploit others. And the psalmist is wisely calling us that the way of fretting just leads to more of the same. And so... He brings up the radical call to be still. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. In other words, don't be, <laughs> don't believe that the wicked are going to actually win in the end. Even if it makes out in this life for a long time that they stay on top, it will not stay that way forever. The psalmist says it is that in verse 29 of this psalm, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. 
Does that sound a little familiar? Yeah, it's because when Jesus was speaking his Sermon on the Mount, as we know in Matthew chapter 5, he was contemplating this psalm and restating it. And he said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, that word meek is about that, like that word fret we hardly ever use, right? The Greek word for it is praus, and it means to be gentle. It's not weakness, it's meekness. It's an inner strength due to trust in God that he is, his ways are right, and, and living by his character and who he is, and reflecting his goodness and glory is the way to live, regardless of what the world is saying. And this is a word that Jesus attributes to himself. He says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest because I am meek, lowly, gentle of heart. You will find rest for your souls. And we see also just in his activity when he came into Jerusalem to declare the kingdom on Palm Sunday, it says he rode meekly or gently or this Greek word on a donkey, not a war horse, not pushing for his way, but seeking God's will. Another way of saying it is, uh, when you are meek, you, are, you try softer, not harder. You reflect. You give it time. You're patient. You're thoughtful. You meditate on God's word. Seek God's will. You don't just react. You don't just do something. You sit there. Tell me how hard that is. Don't just do something. Sit there. Live out who God has called you to be. Not what others are doing. Live by serving and giving and caring for the poor and feeding the hungry. Not tooting your own horn and trying to promote your own uh, brand. When God wants something in this world to get done, by the way, who does he send in? Okay? He sends in, as he would say in uh, the beginning of Matthew 5 with the Beatitudes, he sends in the spiritually poor, those who know that they're bankrupt, that they need God totally. He sends in the merciful. He sends in those who are peacemakers. When God wants someone to comfort a grieving widow... He sends a servant who has listening ears. When God sees a child that att needs attending to, he sends in a mom with a tender touch or a father with a gentle hand. All of these ways is how God actually works in this world. And this might sound naive, but the psalm says this is the way God actually accomplishes his will in this world. His kingdom grows through those simple acts. And there is going to be a day when Jesus returns in glory Jesus even says in Matthew 25 that he is going to return in glory, and when he does, he will say this to those who were meek, those who followed him, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I'm, I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. That's what he says. Is, did you? That's there. What? What? I missed that one. I missed it up. So as I said, uh, what David Platt said before, what if the real issue is God and how we see God and how we are reflecting God's character? And what better way to see that than in Jesus Christ and how he is the perfect representation of God. He is God himself in human flesh. And how does that change my perspective? And I think that leads us to understand how one can be still. The psalm kind of hints at this, but it doesn't answer it. Um, Walter Brigham says, Psalm 37 is an act of utopian hope. An affirmation about the future, even though the voice of the psalm gives no hint about how to get from here to there. That is, it is no, not known how the wicked will lose the land and the righteous will receive it. It only states that it will be so. In other words, the psalm, if you just take it of itself, you go like, well, how is that supposed to work? It's not working that way. 
But you, when you see it in the whole arc of God's story, from Genesis through Revelation, when you see God fulfilling this story in the person of Jesus Christ, then you start understanding how the meek will inherit the earth, how the way of being still, waiting patiently, fretting not, works out. It is in Jesus Christ we meet one who shows us what it's like to not fret, to be able to reflect on God and to live out his character. We hear Jesus speak of a kingdom where he uh, says it is made up of peacemakers and the merciful and the meek and the pure in heart, as he says in the Beatitudes. And when I hear those words, sometimes I go like, well, yeah, that's great, but that's not me. I'm still fretting. I'm still trying to get back and get even. But then when I think this is the point that we have to understand both about this psalm and about the Beatitudes and about Jesus' teaching in general, Jesus' teaching is not a to-do list for how you are supposed to get into heaven by doing certain things. Jesus' teaching is not a, um, a list of how to be good. Jesus' teaching is about Jesus. He's the pure in heart. He's the merciful. He's the peacemaker who makes peace through the blood of his cross. And Jesus is the one who was thrust right into the chaos of this world of all these competing voices, of all these people trying to run it their way, of everybody playing God. And he is the one who is God in the flesh. And we push him out of this world upon a cross and there, in the restless agony of bearing our sins, he gives us his peace. Of losing all, he gives us the victory. Of thirsting, he gives us the spirit to quench us. Of emptying himself to fill us. Of becoming sin at that cross to forgive you. And it's when I think we're at that cross and we see that drama and we see what's actually going on there. And we stop. We have nothing to say. We're just astounded. We're shocked. We're blown away. That's how we become still. In fact, by the way, the Hebrew word for be still, I, I found this interesting in this psalm, is dama. And it means to grow dumb, be silent, or be stupefied. I love that word. I need to be stupefied. To just go like, yeah, anything I'd say right now is just something stupid, so don't say anything. Just be still. No, God is God when he's hanging on the cross dead for you. That God has done everything for you that you can, as the psalm says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give the desires of your heart because when you delight in the Lord, you realize you are the delight of his heart. You are the treasure that he has sought. You are the apple of his eye. You are the greatest thing. And he focuses everything to redeem you, to restore you, and finally to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Be still. It's time for us to be stupefied, be astounded, to be loved, to just be, to be his. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day, for um, this series. The beginning of this year is not a to-do list year, Lord. It's a year to be and to become. Lord Jesus, we want to become more like you. We not want to become more like you so that, Lord God, um, well, then we live, we do, uh, we respond out of the being that you've made us, that we become those who live just out of your goodness and grace, your promises and truth, that we respond to your gospel, Lord God. Heavenly Father, I pray that... Uh, You'd be with us in this new year. 
We have no idea what this year is going to bring. <laughs> we have faced so many times, Lord, when the plans that we've tried to make and the things that we're accomplishing or trying to do, Lord, well, they just, uh, they fall apart. Uh, it doesn't work that way. It's hard to, but the one thing that we know, Lord, is not what uh, we have to all do, but we know for sure you want us to become, to become more yours to be more at peace, at rest, to be still before you, to focus on you and your character for whom we worship is what we become, Lord. Forgive us for having <laughs> gone after so many other things in this world to envy those who are proud and arrogant and seem to get ahead, Lord, but they're not really the winners in the end. It's the lamb who was slain, who is the victor, Lord. And we declare that this day. It is through your sacrifice, Jesus Christ, through your cross and resurrection, we know how this world will turn out and that the meek will inherit the earth, that you will uh, bring us the kingdom in its fullness and glory one day, Lord, so we can be still and not fret. We lift up to you all those who are facing illness right now, Lord God. We know there are many in our midst. It's been a tough few years, Lord, with COVID and flu and RSV and everything else, Lord God. We pray your healing. We pray, Lord, for those who start this new year with a lot of questions of what's going on, Lord. You know the financial impact that inflation has had on many households, Lord. You know here in Southwest Florida how many people are facing a housing crisis and they're struggling as well, Lord, with what's going on and rebuilding and everything else that's gone on, Lord God. And we just pray that you give them uh, the assurance you are with them, that we can be beside them and we can be still and present to them your goodness and grace, Lord. Heavenly Father, as um, a new academic year begins, as well as um, a new uh, school semester begins, Lord, we pray that you'd be with um, all those who are learning. Bless them, Lord. Have them grow closer to you, and not just grow in skills and knowledge, but also to build and grow in their character. Lord God, um, all these things we lift up to you this day, knowing what we need more than anything is to simply be still and know you are our God. We are your people. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.